Hi everybody, Craig from the University of Applied Research and Development, and it is our privilege to have with us Dr. Osada, who is the Emergency Management and Medicine Specialist at the Sri Lankan National Hospital. Hi, Dr. Osada. Hello, how are you? Great uh, to have you with us. Why don't you tell us about how you became interested and involved in emergency medicine? Yes, first of all, I should uh, thank you and I highly appreciate the opportunity given to talk to emergency management students of yours um, and to share my experience. Um, so what's my role? It's I'm basically a doctor. I'm an em uh, em emergency doctor. Now, uh, having been completed my MD in emergency medicine, now I'm going to uh, work as a, a senior registrar in emergency medicine. So I'll be soon become a uh, consultant in emergency medicine within next year or so. So, uh, so why I love emergency medicine? Because simply it's emergency. So uh, that's my sort of case I would love to handle. And uh, when there's a, a part of uh, uh, medicine in there, so it becomes very interesting. It's like not slow, it's very fast sort of medicine. Okay, so um, so when uh, I was initially a, a medical officer in anesthesiology, so that drove me to this field, and I chose this. And um, so uh, then the when we uh, talk about the inception of the uh, the specialty of emergency medicine in Sri Lanka, uh, there were two main. Uh, 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 triggers to uh, the inception of the uh, field of emergency medicine in Sri Lanka. Number one was we had a 30 year old long civil war in this country, which mm. was ended uh, in a big war victory in 2009. So we had many war casualties. The second one is we had the uh, Indian Ocean tsunami. We were badly hit. We had like 40,000 casualties. Wow. That was in 2004. So those two incidents so uh, uh, drew all the uh, officials, the government officials and the health sector uh, management uh, sector to uh, build this new specialty called emergency medicine in this country. So we were like six to seven years old. So e even at the beginning for the inception, the disaster could, uh, should have to take place. So the disaster led to this uh, birth of this speciality. So why not we learn a bit of disaster in uh, emergency medicine? Like it has a huge role to do like uh, in, a, in a country like uh, uh, Sri Lanka. So that was the first reason. So then after the civil war, we were like having a peaceful 10 years. We were okay, no bombs, no blasts, nothing. So when you had the Christchurch in Christ Church incident in New Zealand, mm. in the same year, we had the uh, Easter bomb attack. So that was a, a terrorist bomb attack targeting several churches in this country. And that uh, resulted like 300 deaths and many more casualties. Wow. So at that time, I was a medic, I was an emergency medical registrar at the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. So I happened to uh, travel to two hospitals on the same day because I, my hometown was somewhere away from the capital. So mm. first I visited the, uh, that was a district general hospital, uh, like 40 to 50 kilometers away from the capital. That was Nikambo. First I visited that hospital, I saw the casualties there, and then I, I came to the capital national hospital. Then there were a significant difference in responding to the same disaster that was national emergency, that was national disaster, there was significant difference between the disaster response in those two hospitals. So that was the uh, first trigger I got that I should study deep into the disaster medicine while I'm doing emergency medicine. So I wanted to study why there was a difference. That was the main, main, main trigger. Then I thought there was a... Uh, remarkable uh, uh, gap in disaster preparedness in those two hospitals. Mm. Those are the two problems I identified. So that, uh, so that uh, made me to do a uh, master's in disaster medicine as well. So uh, I completed it 
just that uh, just at the uh, end of last year so uh, after that uh, i uh, my dissertation was about uh, disaster preparedness in the emergency and emergency department uh, staff so uh, that problem led me to uh, write that dissertation and that was my topic so that was the beginning of the story <laughs> so 30 years civil war a yeah. tsunami which took many people's lives yeah. a bomb attack and yeah. through these different scenarios and you responded being a doctor and then you saw that between these two hospitals there was a, a difference a strong difference an observable yeah. difference in both preparedness and the way that they responded could you summarize for us some of the ways that there was a difference in terms of preparedness and response yeah so uh First of all, I should uh, talk to about uh, the uh, disaster management structure in this country. So, uh, um, so in the so there is a system like we talk about incident command systems, and we have a disaster management center. We have a national council for disaster management. Mm. We have all that set up set on. But I thought that even though we have set it like. 10 to 12 years back, we have a national act. We haven't tested it. Mm. The, the most recent uh, the operation we had to test this was in 2019, the Easter bomb attack. Mm. So we tested it. We tested the most crucial and the critical point, And we saw it, it was a failure. So even though we have a set system, so when we have this kind of a disaster, so most of the response agencies were tri forces and fire department and the ambulance services. Luckily, we have uh, we have only one and but one of the best uh, ambulance services called Suez area uh, ambulance service uh, to for the retrieval part of the disaster. Mm. But they were but they were not talking in the common language. We know you know we when we talking about incident command systems, the interdepartmental communication is a common language. So mm. I don't think even tri forces had a common language at that point. So, mm. uh, so that was one problem. The major response agencies were tri forces and fire and ambulances, but they even they didn't have a common language talk in between. So other problem, so I saw like there were two sort of incident commanders. One was the non-health, like non-health incident commanders, like the fire, uh, tri forces and ambulance crew and a lot of other uh, uh, for people who were outside the hospital. And in the inside the hospital, the health department incident commanders were there. So at the door of the accident and emergency department, there was an interface between these non-medical or the non-health sector incident commanders and the health department incident commanders. So I saw a lack of communication in that particular interface. That interface was like, uh, it was not well, well communicated. And at that interface, there were no good inf information flow. So we didn't right. know what was coming in. So like the uh, first, the uh, best uh, example I should uh, tell you is like, we first got the dead bodies. Then came the casualties. So like the ambulances, ambulance crew was, was transporting what they were loaded in. They didn't know what to transport. So mm. I I don't believe that they, at the initial few hours there was uh, a field trial at that moment. And the, the reason for the difference between two hospitals mm. were the, the national hospital that was in the capital that has uh, uh, most number of specialist doctors, emergency doctors, trauma surgeons, and uh, well-planned uh, incident command system, in-hospital disaster management system, hospital uh, in-hospital operation plan, all were there, and they were practiced and trained continuously, simulation right. program. But yeah. the peripheral hospital, they were not prepared. The preparedness was very less. And uh, like uh, there were no outreach programs. So, uh, we, I actually saw that was heartbreaking. So mm. the local fishermen were controlling the traffic outside the Nigambo hospital, but that was not in the capital. So uh, the 
the Gambo Hospital for the peripheral hospital, like that was a real disaster. But center, the capital, in the capital, we actually, like we managed well. So I thought, why not? We, the doctors should learn about this uh, gap in the interface we are facing uh, when we were intermingling with two types of incident commanders from non-health and health. And why not we prepare ourselves more? Mm. And that so we can mitigate the next disaster. Mm. And we all should learn a common language too. I just noted down a number of things there that there was a, a different, even though there's a system in place, there yeah. was the language, the communication language that was different in the health and non-health. And then we also had the um, different commanders, you know, from the different industrial perspectives and the lack of simulation or practice so that yeah. people didn't know who should do what so that yeah. they were prepared. I think that you just said that the local fishermen were directing traffic outside the capital, which is a wonderful thing for them to do, a lovely response for them to do, but it's not their area of specialty or their area of practice. Yeah. People want to help, but they need to know how to help. And that's yeah. the, the role of the simulation. So you've identified a number of problems there. So you um, have studied with you in your own time, while you're a doctor doing your master's in disaster management as well, tell yeah. us about some of the things that you you are trying to put in place in Sri Lanka through the National Hospital. Um, so uh, I uh, think like we need to uh, focus on three things. First is disaster medicine. So even in my thesis, I highlighted that like continuous education mm -hmm. and uh, Simulation, continuous training would give you a better outcome. And the, uh, the main problem, there was a lack of knowledge in disaster medicine that was evident between doctors and nurses. Because mm -hmm. when we used a Likert style questionnaire, like it was called the EPIC questionnaire, we used to check their knowledge in disaster preparedness. There's a huge knowledge gap between doctors and nurses. So first is the knowledge you need to learn disaster medicine. And all components should be, you should be thorough with that. Then you have to practice. Third thing, that you should learn the leadership in crisis. So there was a lack of leadership. There were many leaders, like incident commanders across different departments, but they were lacking in communication in between the departments and they were not using a common language. So we don't know what tribe forces are putting into the ambulance. So ambulance are, don't know what they are transporting into the hospital. Yeah, mm. we don't know what we are getting. So leadership in crisis. So mm. uh, management, there's an issue. And we have to improve in our retrieval, retrieval uh, practice, retrieval medicine. So one thing I'm very satisfied about is in Sri Lanka, we have a well-placed, well-organized uh, and emergency ambulance service called, that's the National Island-wide Ambulance Service, that's called 1990, or Suicide Ambulance Service. When you call 1990, the emergency number, they mm. will reach you within mean time of 12 minutes. Mm. So I, I and most of our emergency registrars work in the call center, giving all the phone advices to the emergency medical technicians. Mm. So I work there. Even I work there on the day of the uh, Easter bomb blast. So, uh, uh, that was a good experience and they are working fine, but we need to refine that service. Mm -hmm. So those are the main four areas, uh, three to four areas I need to improve upon. And uh, the most the special interest is the use of uh, focus ultrasound in the mm. field disaster, uh, in the field disaster response. I, I thought of uh, like, why not, uh, we have ambulances or uh, outreach teams having uh, portable large sound probes to you go into the disaster field. So you can always uh, uh, facilitate your triaging or facilitate your ongoing uh, ongoing treatment to, to the patients in the field and as well as in the transporting procedure with focus ultrasound. Hmm. So uh, we thought of introducing uh, uh, first uh, handheld ultrasound probes. So we demonstrated in uh, back in 2019 uh, in National Hospital. So uh, we liaised with 
uh, few uh, local ultrasound uh, merchandise groups like Technomedics and talked to Philips uh, region coordinator and we got it down and demonstrated it. We tried it, but then we were badly hit with COVID in 2020. Right. So most of the plans were shattered after then. Can I just share some photos that you've kindly sent me uh, yeah. just with, <laughs> with the ultrasound? Obviously in other countries, um, portable ultrasound is used, but it's a new innovation yeah. that you've brought into the country. So let me just share, let me just check. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah, thank you very much. So um, this is uh, where the, uh, we introduced the uh, first ever uh, uh, portable ultrasound machine. We demonstrated it first in uh, National Hospital. That was back in 2019. So uh, so in the left, that was me and the other person. He's the uh, uh, region representative for Philips. So he came with uh, Philips Lumify, the portable ultrasound probe. So maybe for you, countries like you, it was not new, but for us, it was uh, it was the first time experience we had. Mm. So we thought of uh, getting more and more uh, hand-on experience with the portable ultrasound probes and uh, giving them to uh, emergency departments and outreach teams like uh, retrieval teams. So I designed the uh, ultrasound uh, course called Focus Focus. That was like, I designed, the, this was like, we had very low resource setting. Uh -huh. uh, we conducted like uh, four to five uh, ultrasound courses throughout the country. And um, this was, I was delivering a lecture. Um, so that's that was one of my dreams, to incorporate focus ultrasound into disaster. Wow. Disaster makes him like. Well, look, congratulations on... Um bringing that innovation to Sri Lanka, I'm sure that it will solve a number of problems that you've seen actually out in the field. Congratulations on doing that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Also, I just want to summarize um, the problems that you saw in the way that people and the organizations were communicating and preparedness, the solutions that you're putting, that you're putting into place. Number one, simulations. Number two, yeah. training. Number three is that disaster um, medicine, the retrieval processes and things that go along with that. And number four is the actual leadership in times of crisis and the communication that happens from the leaders. That's the four solutions? Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Osada, yeah. I, I think yeah. you're doing amazing, amazing things there. And I love that you are responding to to what you've seen then, not only national crises, but also things that have impacted you as a professional in your field, but you've actually put the time and energy into learning new things and implementing innovations in your country. And I really want to commend you for what you're doing. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I've put your LinkedIn um, link will be with the show notes with this video on LinkedIn and on YouTube and on Facebook. Yeah. Are there other ways that people can communicate with you? Sure, that's 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 great. Is it is it better to communicate with you on LinkedIn, or is there another way that people can communicate with you? Um, LinkedIn is better, and uh, you can share my email address as well if they want to communicate. Okay, well, thank you very very much for your time. I appreciate it. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy day, and thank you yeah. so much for the work that you're doing in Sri Lanka to make it better for people's lives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for reaching out and uh, give me an opportunity and to let us share our experience.